Welcome to the Known Victory Church YouTube channel. We are so glad that you found us today. We exist to make Jesus known and to be a place that anyone can call home. If you haven't yet, make sure to subscribe, like, and share these messages so we can truly make Jesus known in our homes, cities, and across the world. We pray that this message impacts you and helps you to grow closer to Jesus. Uh, man, it's so nice to be home. Uh, last week we were in Calgary we were at our... Uh, uh, Legacy Conference, uh, which was our Young Adults Conference. And, uh, you know, we were in, you know, one church, and then I spoke at a different church on Sunday morning, our uh, Victory Outreach. But it's so amazing to be home um, because there's nothing like, there's no place like home, right? Uh, and so, man, it's just so nice to be home. Um, but I just want to show you a couple of pictures. We had an opportunity at our Legacy Conference uh, right on the right there. There's no picture of me speaking, but that's Jane worshiping with our crew our Legacy Conference crew. We had about 100 young adults uh, at the Legacy Conference this past weekend uh, in Calgary at my old church. Um, And so Jane was joining some of our team. You might recognize Cooper right there. He uh, put on the conference. And then uh, right above those hands clapping is Pastor Dave Myers, who is my pastor from my old church. And it was an incredible, incredible weekend. Some young adults gave their lives to Jesus this weekend, which is absolutely amazing. Uh, And then uh, on on your right there, that's me. I was speaking at our outreach church in Calgary, East Side Victory Church. And we had an amazing time speaking there. They had about a, a hundred people there. And, you know, that church does incredible, incredible things. They have food ministries and they have uh, ministries that work with, with getting women off the streets from, uh, from prostitution, giving them a place to have a shower and give them clothes. And, and, you know, it's an incredible, incredible church. And we had the honor of speaking there and being there this past Sunday. Um, and it was, it was just a really, really good weekend. Um, and so thank you to our team who made uh, our Sunday service happen, our Sunday gathering happen this past uh, weekend without us here. It's nice to be able to go away and that our team can still run church without me and without Beth. It's actually incredible because uh, it's not always easy and not always possible. And so we're in this uh, series, summer series that we're going to continue today uh, called Questions God Asks Us. And it, it's a series that we've been going through and I've been enjoying it. Um, some of it, you know, to me almost seems like repetitive. I feel like I sometimes preach on these topics a lot, but I think it's always good to have these reminders of, uh, of the things that we might go through and the questions that God might be asking you and asking me in the midst of whatever it is that we're going through. And while we were in Calgary, uh, I witnessed and experienced one of the most vicious storms I've ever seen in my entire life. I don't know if you heard about the hailstorm that hit Calgary this past weekend. Uh, We were there. You can see a picture. That's my hand right there. That's the hail that came from the sky. Uh, It's hard to see, but my car is dented. I'm telling you. It looks like, I don't know what it looks like. Not good, right? Um, But that was the hailstorm we experienced this past weekend. You know, we even got an emergency alert on our phone being like, watch out for baseball size hail. Now that's not quite baseball size hail, but but a golf ball size sale. And I'd never experienced a storm like this before. We we're in the house and we had just put Jane to bed. It was about maybe eight o'clock, 7.30, eight o'clock. And about two minutes later, after the storm starts, Jane comes running up the stairs. She's like, what's going on, right? She didn't know. All of a sudden she hears, hears just these, this crashing going into the roof of the house. We're in man and uncle's house. Um, they had dents in their door. Uh, they had dents in their garage door. Uh, it was absolutely an incredible, incredible, incredible storm. And that's the hail that we experienced. And it was funny because we look out and the, the, the drain had clogged on their street. And so we look out in our car. I'm not, I'm, I'm not exaggerating. It was in at least six inches of water in the middle of the street because the drain had clogged. And so Beth's like, hey, can you go out and move our car? Because I'm like, yeah, someone might lose control and hit it. We're parked on the the road. And so we moved it on to the driveway. But it was an absolutely incredible, incredible storm. And the next question that come, that we're gonna go through today comes in the midst of a great, great storm. We're gonna be going through the next question this morning that comes in Matthew chapter eight. And this is when Jesus calms the storm. It starts off in verse 23. It says this, then Jesus got into the boat and started across the lake with his disciples. See, Jesus and his disciples, they had a destination in mind. And what, if you know much about the disciples, they trusted Jesus, right? You know, they trusted Jesus. When Jesus said go, they went. When Jesus said stay, they stayed. When, when Jesus said, you know, wait, they waited. They, they, they trusted Jesus in the middle of this moment. And so they trust Jesus. And where they're going, this destination is on the other side of the Sea of Galilee. 
And now the Sea of Galilee is not a huge body of water, really. It's a it's it's a hundred and sixty six kilometer square. This 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 lake, uh, this freshwater lake that they were in, which is about half the size of Okanagan Lake in British Columbia. It's not this massive massive amount of water, but it was a small body of water that experienced great great storms. Because wind would come over from the sea and wind would come from the mountains and it would create this atmosphere in the middle of this sea that was absolutely incredible. And these storms would usually happen during the daytime, but as we all know with weather, you never can predict really what's going to happen. You know, this was a saying in Calgary, maybe it's the same here, it's like if you don't like the weather, wait five minutes, right? You know, this weather changes quickly and sometimes the, you know, they'll predict it and then it's complete opposite of what they predict. And then what we do, if we're going on vacation, maybe this is just me, but I know I'm going to British Columbia, let's say, to Kelowna or something. I'm always looking at the weather weeks in advance, even though it pretty much means nothing. Except for when you go to like Kelowna in the summer, in the summer it's basically just hot, right? Maybe you'll get a little bit of rain. Um, but but I, I, we, we can't predict this weather. And this is exactly what took place this day as Jesus and his disciples were on away, this destination to get to the other side of the lake. And we can read it in verse 24, suddenly, a fierce storm struck the lake with waves breaking into the boat. I love how it says suddenly because you, we know how suddenly a storm can come. Because I got this notification, uh, it was, uh, was it Sunday night? I think it was Sunday night. We got this notification, hey, watch out, hail's coming. Emergency text on our phones. And I'm telling you within minutes, all of a sudden we heard it, right? You, can, you could hear the storm because it was an absolutely incredible storm. I was watching it because it's, it's something to see, but suddenly a storm comes, something that in a lot of ways was unpredicted, something they weren't expecting because it says suddenly a storm hit the lake with waves breaking into the boat. And this is the place that Jesus was leading them. Jesus got in the boat and he was leading them and all of a sudden, boom, they're in the middle of a storm. See, see Jesus protects us from storm. When, when Jesus protects us from storms, he's all knowing. When he protects us from the storm, the storm's coming and he gets us out of the way or moves the storm. That means that God is all knowing. But when Jesus protects us in the storm, it means he's all powerful. And so we serve a God who's all knowing and all powerful. The one who can, who can make the storm miss us or the one who can protect us in the middle of the storm. But we often like the first one when we don't actually experience the storm. I can tell you my car felt that way on Sunday night. I was grateful because we didn't have any window smashed. We had a little dent in our windshield, that's it. All I was really concerned about was, man, I really hope I don't have to replace my windshield before we like go home, you know? Um, but God protects us from the storm. We like that reality more than we like the reality of facing the storm head on. And the disciples here, they're faced with this reality of, hey, we're in the middle of this storm. And this is the next part of that verse. It says this, but Jesus was sleeping. Now, I love this part of the story because it shows Jesus' humanity in a lot of ways. But it also kind of shows his divine nature as well, kind of together. See, Jesus was tired. You know, it, 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 there's one thing about sleeping on a boat in the middle of a storm. It's no small task. It's not going to be easy. And if you read through uh, Matthew chapter 8, even before, he had been healing people. He'd been having these theological conversations and, and having discussions about, about theology. And, and, and they're having these things. And to be honest, Jesus is tired. So what does he do? He goes to the bottom of the boat and he falls asleep. And I think sometimes for us, this is how we feel in the midst of the storm we see, we feel like Jesus is sleeping in the middle of it. The storm's fierce, yet God might seem silent. Have you ever felt that way in life when you're going through something and you feel like God is silent or Jesus isn't speaking and you read the scriptures, you're like, God, I'm not... I'm not getting anything. I'm not receiving anything. You pray and it feels like you're talking to your spouse when they're on their phone, dead ears, right? Can't understand what they're saying. Like, like, like this is sometimes how it feels in life. But I think this idea of Jesus sleeping in the storm brings a sense of peace. Because you know what it takes to actually sleep in the middle of a storm? It takes this overwhelming sense of peace and trust that you're gonna be okay. Right, it, it, it's hard. And you know why we know that we're gonna be okay? is because Jesus isn't too concerned about the storm. You know what they say about if you're afraid to fly in an airplane or concerned that an airplane is gonna crash when you're on it, they say, look at the flight attendants, right? 
If the flight attendants are calm, cool, and collected, you know you're going to be okay. If the flight attendants are panicking, it's time to panic. Right? That's what they say about flying on an airplane. But when we go through life, it's the same way. We look to Jesus in the middle of the storm, and we, we mirror what Jesus is doing. What's Jesus doing? He's resting in the middle of the storm, which takes an absolutely astronomical amount of peace that I think some of us are just wishing for. This peace that passes all understanding. We don't have to be afraid in the middle of the storm. Why? Because Jesus, our rock, isn't afraid. He isn't concerned about the waves. He's not concerned about the wind. He's not concerned about the hail. He's calm enough and peaceful enough to sleep in the middle of the storm. And you know what this takes? Almost courage. You know, sometimes I can barely sleep in my own bed when I have an alarm set for early in the morning. An alarm set where I'm worried I'm gonna miss it. You know, you got a meeting early, you gotta be somewhere early, and you're like, uh-oh. And so my, my mind's always racing, what if I miss it? What if I miss it? What if I miss it? And there's been a few times Beth's like, hey, oh, it's, you know, it's 6.30, right? I'm like, Hoo! you know, that happens. But I get this anxiety almost that comes, comes up when, when I'm trying to set an alarm and I, I'm afraid I'm gonna sleep through the alarm. I often don't sleep well on those nights. To be honest, some of the worst nights of sleep I get are Saturday nights before church on Sunday. To be honest, I probably average between three and five hours a night on Saturday night just because, you know, I have a hard time falling asleep and then I get up super early. But Jesus is sleeping in the middle of their storm, which brings, I think, this deep sense of peace that in the middle of whatever we're going through, Jesus is still calm, cool, and collected. That Jesus isn't panicking. Jesus isn't afraid. But we can see in verse 25, this is what it said. The disciples went and woke him up shouting, right? They're petrified. Lord, save us. We're going to drown. Jesus is sleeping. The disciples, that's a start in the way to wake up, right? Jesus, wake up. We're about to drown. You know, a lot of us would wake up and be like, what do we do? What do we do, right? Now, we have to remember something about the stories that Jesus, the disciples that were in the boat, a lot, some of them were professional fishermen. They were professional fishermen. They, they fished for a living. They weren't an amateur like Christian. They were a professional fisherman. An amateur like me might be a better way to say it. You, see, Christians caught more fish than me, and I've caught more weeds than him. So you see what I mean? <laughs> but they're professional fishermen in the midst of this storm. And we can see this reality when you, if you read when Jesus called his first disciples in Matthew chapter 4 and verse 18. says this, one day as Jesus was walking along the shore of where the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, also called Peter, and Andrew throwing a net in the water for they loved fishing, for, and for they fished for a living. So this storm, this sea that they're in wasn't a new environment. It wasn't like they were on a new, a new sea or a new lake. It wasn't like they, they were on a different boat, maybe even. They were on the middle of, a, middle of the sea where they'd been before on a boat sailing across. And what do they feel? They feel scared. What does this prove? This was a great storm. This was a powerful, powerful, powerful storm. A storm to be afraid of. A storm that had surpassed anything they had seen before or even something that they thought they could handle. So what do they do? They go wake up the carpenter. For real. The one who built the boat maybe, right? They go wake up Jesus, be like, you're the carpenter, figure it out, right? He's like, I built the boat, yo. <laughs> they're afraid. And they're not just afraid, they're very afraid. You know, I think this is a space we get to sometimes. You know, what we're afraid of is something we've seen before. What we're afraid of is something we've seen in before, but the magnitude of what we're facing seems larger and more surreal than anything we've seen before. We've, we've seen it. It's not new. It's not a new environment. It's not a new situation. It's just a bigger storm. The magnitude of it is stronger. And I think sometimes the, storm we, the storms we face get stronger. Why? Because we get stronger. I think sometimes the, stor the, storms get, the storms get stronger, but we've gotten smarter. We've gotten closer to Jesus. See, the disciples, it's actually fascinating that they don't know what to do. They go wake up Jesus in the boat. They're like, you, you got to save us. We're about to drown. And that's the best place we can go in the middle of a storm is go to Jesus. 
Go to him with our worries and our anxiety and our fear. Go with him with our pain. Go with him with the concerns. Go with, to him when we're panicked. It's the best place we can go. See, a life with Jesus isn't stormless. We wish it was, but it's not stormless, which sometimes we hope it would be stormless when we walk with Jesus. So this is the most encouraging verse you'll read in the Bible, James chapter one, verse two to four. Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come, come your way, consider it a great opportunity for joy. Consider it an opportunity for great joy when trials come, when storms come. Why? For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. See, in the middle of the storm, that's one of the greatest places for us to grow our faith. It's one of the greatest places for us to grow our hope and grow our joy in the midst of the storm because the storms make us stronger. You know, we feel like the, the, the storm might be so big and so abstract and so massive, we feel like we can't go any way. Do you know what we gotta do? We gotta bring it to Jesus and consider it great joy. They will come, the storms are gonna come, but they will help us grow. They will help us learn. They will build our faith and build our perseverance and every storm makes us stronger. Every trial builds us up. It builds our perseverance and builds our endurance to keep on going. So we can be a lighthouse standing in the middle of a storm, guiding people home and helping people along the way to grow closer to Jesus as well. Then verse 26 says this, Jesus responded with the question, why are you afraid? You have so little faith. The big question, why are you afraid? That's the question I think God might be asking us today. Why are you afraid? And the disciples, they had a list of things why they were afraid. They had a big list. Jesus, if only you hadn't been taking a nap, you would know why we're afraid. Open your eyes and look around. Do you see why we're afraid? This list. The storm is raging and the boat is filling with water. The waves are too big and the rain is falling and our life jackets have fallen overboard and Peter almost fell out of the boat. We had to catch him midair and bring him back in. Do you see the storm we're in? Are you seeing what's going on? I think sometimes we try and bring Jesus into our pity and into our fear. And Jesus says, I'm taking you out of it. We try and, we try and take Jesus into our most fearful moments. We try and take him into it. And he's like, ah, you're not supposed to live in a place of fear. He says, he says, you can be there, but I'm taking you out of it. I will make you stronger. I will give you faith. I will give you courage. I will give you joy. I will give you what you need to overcome. But you got to step into my arms and let me carry you and let me hold you and let me be the one to guide you home. See, we're good at panic as human beings. We're very good at panic as human beings. And we see this throughout history. We see this recently. If you look at, you know, the pandemic, panic is something that we're very good at as human beings. But Jesus, I think, is telling us in the midst of our fear, in the midst of our panic, he's saying, I'm not succumbing to fear. The storm has no power when it faces me. It might seem strong, but the power of the storm is minuscule when the Father is in the room. What are you afraid of? See, our deepest fears often indicate our deepest insecurities as humans. When we look at our deepest fears, it might bring up something about a deep insecurity we have. If our biggest fear is about the, is about our, or if our biggest insecurity is about our finances, that might mean our biggest fear might be the economy or our bank accounts. If we're insecure about our relationships, our spouse's behavior might start bringing us real and deep fear. If we're insecure about our health, any oddity in our body will cause us great fear. What are your biggest insecurities oftentimes lead us to our biggest fears? What is your biggest fear? What, what is your biggest insecurity? And what I wanna encourage you with you this morning, just like Jesus was on the boat with them. See, Jesus didn't send them into the storm by themselves, which he did sometimes. He said, I'll meet you on the other side. And then he walked on water one time. 
but he, he didn't send them by himself. Jesus was on the boat with them. And this is early in Jesus's ministry. This isn't late in his ministry. This is early in his ministry. And he says, hey, go, go. I'm going with you across the, across the water. See, Jesus is with you wherever you go. He might seem silent. He might seem distant, but oftentimes we aren't in the right place. We're not we're looking for him in the right places. Maybe we're on top of the boat, wondering what to do about the waves, what to do about the wind, what to do about the rain, when we have no control. Do you know what the reality of storms is? We can't control the storms as human beings. I can't control the severity. I can't control the size of hail. I wish I could. I can't do it on my own, but Jesus has the power. And the Holy Spirit comes and gives us power. We're looking on the top of the boat for Jesus, and Jesus is in the bottom of the boat taking a, re- a nap. He's saying, maybe it's time to rest. You know what I think will build our faith more than anything is if we can learn to rest in the middle of the storm rather than let anxiety take over. Rather than it let panic and fear take over. What if in the midst of our biggest moment, a panic attack or an anxiety attack or depression, what if we could rest? What if we stopped worrying and we learned how to rest? We're looking for Jesus on the top of the boat sometimes and he's, he's sleeping in the bottom of the boat. A storm is something we can't predict, we can't prevent. But where do you go when the storm comes? Because it matters where we go. What do you do to cope when the storm comes? It might be food or alcohol, or sex, or video games, or movies. Or maybe you check out. Storm comes, maybe you just check out, and that's often my response. I check out. Sometimes I get a little mopey, I get a little sad when the storm's coming. I'm like, woe is me. And I have to have a reality check on myself, and oftentimes it's not me who has the reality check. Sometimes it's Beth, and she's like, this is a problem. She's the one who calls me out. And do I like it most times? Absolutely, I do not. But I need it. Sometimes we need somebody to be around us and say, hey, you're going there. You're going to your normal coping mechanism for when the storm comes. That's the wrong location. You're going to the the wrong location. We have to find the right source for energy and courage. See, alcohol is a liar. Pornography is a liar. Food is a liar. It's delicious though. Shopping can be a liar. It's a liar. Jesus is the source we need to go to. And then Jesus does this. He says, it says, then he got up and rebuked the wind and waves and suddenly, again, there's that word suddenly, from stormy to calm, suddenly there was a great calm. See, as as great as the storm was, the calm was even greater. That in the middle of the storm, Jesus can get up and he can calm the waves. He can calm the sea. See, he isn't shocked by the storm. He's seen it before. In fact, it's not probably the first time the storm you're going through is the storm that a human being has faced. He isn't shocked or surprised. In verse 27, then the disciples were amazed. Who is this man, they asked. Even the wind and waves obey him. Even the storm has no power. What did God do? God created the earth, created the elements. He can contain the elements. He can calm the storms in your heart. He can calm the storms in our minds. I truly believe this. Why are you afraid? I think Jesus is asking us this question. Why are you afraid? And some of us, we might have a long list. We might have a long list of things that we're afraid of. We're afraid of maybe the economy or we're afraid of government or afraid of some of our relationships or we're afraid of our addiction. We're afraid that someone's gonna see us in our broken state. We're afraid of ourselves and how we're gonna respond because our patience is low and our anger is high. We're afraid. 
and the storms rage. Again, the promise isn't that we're going to live a stormless life. It's that we're going to live an abundant life and the storms are still going to be going on. But are we strong enough to go into the bottom of the boat and take a nap? Are you strong enough to rest even when you're busy? It's not easy to rest when the storms come because when the storm comes, we go into fight mode. What do I got to do? Or we go into flight mode and we just jump off the boat. <laughs> I don't know. What do we do when the storms come? Why are you afraid? See, the storm might be strong, but our God is stronger. The wave may seem powerful, but our God is more powerful. And in fact, he's all powerful. And the hail may seem to cause a, a lot of damage. I took a picture driving home from my dad's house. And this is the picture. It might be hard to see it. I don't know if you can see it. These houses have all been hit by hail. You can see all the siding. It's like you can see right through it. It's hard to see, I know. But all these houses have been severely damaged by hail. You know, and that's uh, something, you know, that's an insurance nightmare right there, right? My mom told me a story. They have a neighbor who just moved to her community to get out of the communities that are often hit by these big hailstorms. And literally... I think it was two, three weeks later, they got hit by a hailstorm in that house. It's tough. Storms come. These homes were hit hard by the storm. But guess what? They're still standing. You know, when you make it through the storm, which sometimes doesn't seem possible, but you will make it through. And when you make it through, there may be wounds, there may be scars. It's not necessarily going to be easy. But guess what? You're still standing. You may be bruised, but you're still breathing. You'll make it through. We got to go to Jesus. You know what the reality of storms is? You might not make it out on your own. We need Jesus to help us and give us courage and give us strength and help us as we walk through life's hardest, most difficult moments to invite Jesus into the room and stop running away. It's our running to Jesus. Why are you so afraid? That's our takeaway today. Why are you so afraid? You know, every question we've gone through, really, it's a question of reflection of why am I afraid? Maybe we've never taken a moment to diagnose or understand. Why, why is it that I'm so afraid when I watch the news every night? Why, why am I afraid? Why is it that my anxiety starts speaking when I'm scrolling through Instagram? Why is it that as soon as I step a foot in my door and go, out, go, go into my house with my family, why does fear come? Why is it that every time I get in my car, fear comes? Or when I go to work, why is fear here? Why is fear present in the middle of this? And when he asks the question, why are you afraid? I think sometimes he's saying what he similar said in Isaiah. Now this, this was written in a very dark time for Israel. You know, this was to Israel, this was a time of exile and pain. And they've cried out to God. They've even said, you're not paying attention. Just like the disciples, you're not paying attention, Jesus. You know what's going on. It's your fault. This is what God says. It's so powerful and so interesting. And Isaiah 41 verse 10 says this, don't be afraid for I'm with you. Don't be discouraged for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will hold you up with my victorious right hand. See, all your enemies lie there confused and humiliated. Anyone who opposes you will die and come to nothing. You will look in vain for those who tried to conquer you. I love that line. You'll look, you can't even find them anymore. The storm's gone. The storm, that's the thing about storms, they don't stick around, they go. Those who attack you will come to nothing. For I hold you by your right hand. I, the Lord your God, and I say to you, don't be afraid. I am here to help you. Then this powerful line right here, though you are a lowly worm, O Jacob, 
don't be afraid, people of Israel, for I will help you. I am the Lord, your Redeemer. I am the Holy One of Israel. I love that line. Though you are a lowly worm, though you are small, you might seem, feel insignificant. Don't be afraid, for I will help you. <sighs> Don't be afraid. He will help us. He will protect us. He's here to help you, and he's here to help me, and I need his help. If you're afraid today, my prayer is that God will comfort you and meet you there. Because he's here even in this space right now, and he won't leave you, and he won't forsake you. He loves you. You know, the thing about fear is I think it's, it's destroying us as humans because we're so afraid. We're afraid of what tomorrow's gonna look like. We're afraid of the future. We're afraid of the conversation. You ever overthink a conversation? I see the emails from my boss. Hey, can we meet Tuesday morning at 10 a.m.? All weekend, I'm like, oh, what's going on, right? It's not always easy. Life's, life's tough. But Jesus is tougher. And he will comfort you. Don't let fear get in the way. And again, the storm's gonna come, but do you have the courage to take a nap, to get some rest, to not always try to be fighting the storm, but to be taking a moment. And you know what? The greatest way we know we trust Jesus is, is in the middle of the storm. We can take our hands off and say, God, I trust you. I trust you. I've had to do that so many times throughout my life. That prayer of, God, I trust you. Sometimes the prayer is, God, I don't even know why I trust you, but I do. If you take me through this storm, I promise, right? He loves you. I want to pray for us uh, this morning when it comes to fear. So I think it's something we all face in, in different ways, in different aspects, in different, you know, ways, but the answer is always the same. We need the peace of Jesus to meet us in the middle of the storm. I don't know what storm you're coming out of. I don't know what storm you're in. And I don't know what storm you're going to face. But I do know God will be with you wherever you go. And sometimes we got to open our eyes and stop seeing all the problems and start seeing our Savior. Let's pray. God, I thank you. But I thank you that, just like you did in that boat all those years ago, God, that you'll bring that same peace to us today. The same peace that passes understanding will meet us in the middle of the storm we're in. And I thank you that we've made it out of the storms bef before. We'll make it through the, through the storm we're in and we'll make it through the storm we're about to face. And meet us in our fear. And God, help us be strong and courageous. And help us learn to count it all joy when we face trials of many kinds. In Jesus' name, amen.